morning. We now start the session with our experts, uh, with Jörg Cookies. He is State Secretary for Financial Market Policy and European Policy at the German Federal Ministry of Finance, a position he has held since 2018. Previously, he was co-Chief Executive Officer of Goldman Sachs, where he has had a long-lasting uh, career. Uh, Dr. Cookies studied economic science, sciences uh, at Pantheon Sorbonne University in Paris. Uh, he has a master in public administration from Harvard and a PhD in finance from the University of Chicago. Jörg, uh, thank you for being with us uh, again. Uh, we will cover different topics uh, like uh, Europe, uh, Germany, European financial regulation uh, and market structure of the banking sector. Thanks for inviting me. Um, Jörg, since you last joined us, uh, uh, Europe has experienced uh, Brexit uh, and the pandemic, uh, but it has also responded uh, with the recovery fund, uh, which implied the issuance uh, of uh, Eurobonds, uh, uh, which have recently uh, been launched on the market. From your perspective, uh, is this just a first step towards a new, more political course of a more integrated post-Brexit EU? And where is to you the optimal level of integration between stronger federal institutions and subsidiarity to member states? Well, first of all, I think it's an extremely important uh, reaction mechanism and the fact that uh, Europe reacted in this way and reacted in a unified way is extremely important to combat the crisis. So um, technically speaking and from an institutional perspective, of course, the, uh, the um, fund is set up as a one-off instrument. That's the way it's agreed. Um, however, it already entails, I think, quite a lot of elements that can, that can um, shine a light far beyond the, uh, the years of its existence. Uh, for example, the fact that we agreed to finance the, uh, the repayment of the fund through new to be introduced uh, um, own resources of the European Union means that if we get this right and if we do this uh, in, a, in a good way, it could already have um, the grains of further integration. And I think um, as with every, uh, every deepening of any fiscal union, I think the question of own resources, of course, is very much at the center of the um, of the interest, and I think that'll be extremely um, important to see what kind of uh, what kind of uh, new own resources the Commission proposes, and whether they will be consensualized within the European Union, um, especially if they concern uh, elements to um, to internalize the negative external um, effects of pollution. Um, it could actually be a very forward-looking way of, um, of building um, own resources for the European Union. Yes, um, thank you. And so in the past, Europe has spent a great deal of time and energy into agreeing the rules that would keep member states together, uh, not always successfully. Meanwhile, uh, China and the US uh, have focused on developing new technologies uh, and global geopolitical dynamics have uh, radically changed. The impression one has is that Europe has been caught off guard and it is now dependent on the supply of key strategic assets like semiconductors, 5G uh, and data. What is Europe's plan and are we too late to the game? Well, I would argue the the pandemic has also shown that, uh, for example, the biotechnology sector in Europe is not to be underestimated. And the amount of research that went into vaccine from European uh, corporates uh, was quite substantial. And uh, if you look at the uh, location of patents on, uh, on the vaccines to the corona crisis, uh, Europe has a very large share in that. So I wouldn't say unambiguously that, that, uh, that the trend that you're portraying is true. If I look at the massive waves of um, IPOs that we're seeing of technology companies 
um, in Germany and across Europe at the moment. I think there's a lot of hope that uh, that Europe will emerge from this crisis uh, strengthened. So in that sense, I, I, I would put your ideas a little bit in perspective. But on the other side, of course, we know um, how important it is for Europe to continue this trend and, and to make sure that uh, that we become a hub um, of, um, of technology development. I think a lot of the legislation that we're looking at at the moment um, pertains especially uh, to this question a to promote research but b also to grant fair access uh, to uh, platforms um, and distribution networks uh, thank you so after the damage of the pandemic uh, the 60 percent uh, debt to gdp mantra of uh, the eu um, seems surpassed yet some sort of agreement uh, on a return to fiscal discipline is inevitable at some point uh, what is Germany's stance uh, on this front? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I, I think the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, which is often criticized, has actually um, shown that it has much more flexibility that, uh, than uh, some claim that it has, right? I mean, we've been able to uh, go through a very substantial fiscal expansion <clears throat> in the past uh, 16, 18 months and uh, the Stability and Growth Pact hasn't hindered us at all. So in that sense, I think uh, the big question, of course, is uh, when, when to uh, continue to keep the general escape clause alive and when to turn it off again, right? And that's going to be a decision um, for 22. Uh, I think it's a very fair statement that uh, we still need the fiscal space. Uh, but, of course, uh, according to all forecasts, both of the Commission and the European Central Bank, we will be um, surpassing the pre-COVID uh, level of GDP either late in 21 or early in 22, depending on Eurozone, EU, each member state. Um, so in that sense, it's very natural that uh, that a year from now, um, or maybe even a bit less than a year from now, of course, depending on how the pandemic evolves, how the economic return to normalcy re um, evolves by then, uh, we will have a very legitimate uh, discussion around um, um, about uh, not continuing to activate the general escape clause then in 23. Okay, so moving on to... Um... German economic policy. Uh, how is Germany's export-oriented economy adjusting to the China-US Cold War and to the fact that European partners are even more highly indebted now? And do you see the need to rethink the economic model and reposition uh, towards higher domestic consumption? Well, if you look at all of our measures that we took in our massive fiscal expansion over the past uh, uh, a year and a half, um, you know, that's been all about domestic consumption. Uh, we've basically um, almost exactly equalized the loss of uh, of, uh, of earnings power through transfers, be they through the, our short-term labor scheme, be they through direct transfer to consumers. So in that sense, um, we've really um, we've really aimed the bazooka that we launched uh, fiscally um, straight at this question of, uh, of maintaining consumption. Um, of course, we've seen um, everywhere, no matter what the fiscal response was in every country of the world, a massive increase in the savings rate because consumption simply hasn't been possible to the extent um, as, uh, as uh, without the lockdown. So in that sense, I think it, it'll be normal that a lot of the pent up demand that's been saved over the past um, um, 16, 18 months um, of the of the pandemic um, will now translate into consumption. So, so I think that'll be part of the normalization. Um, that being said, we have decided to maintain and extend and expand our fiscal programs into the second half of the year. So in that sense, at the moment, despite the fact that we are relieving lockdown, that we're seeing consumer confident re confidence return, that we're seeing a lot of leading indicators um, not only getting back to normal, but some even being better than normal, we're still maintaining the, the fiscal firepower and still keeping the expansionary stance because uh, one lesson from the last uh, global financial crisis that we've certainly learned is that um, slamming the brakes too early in the, in the interest of consolidation can be very counterproductive. So we definitely want to avoid that and we'll continue to expand fiscally throughout this year and we'll 
consider then in, in, in um, early next year um, how to proceed with uh, with the fiscal uh, uh, policy according to um, how our economy evolves. But uh, certainly, w because you mentioned exports explicitly, um, certainly our export position has helped us massively because, uh, of course, our one part of the very high resilience of our economy during the crisis was due to the fact that our numbers, um, that our export numbers uh, maintained very, very high levels. And uh, of course, through the um, through the asynchronous uh, return to normal in some parts of the world, uh, we were able, um, our, our companies were able to, um, to maintain cash flows in part by exporting to those regions of the world where uh, the lockdowns weren't as severe in others. Great. Um, moving on to governance. Uh, it looks like uh, Europe uh, has embarked on a, a new kind of reform process. Uh, uh, but every time European institutions agree to make further steps uh, towards higher fiscal or monetary integration, uh, Europe has to hold its breath on the quasi-automatic appeal to the Karlsruhe Constitutional Court. Uh, how can Europe work if every national constitutional court can potentially veto already hard to reach uh, European decisions and do you see a solutions there? Well, I think first of all, um, I mean, the German government has always defended the uh, pro-European positions in the constitutional court. So um, I myself uh, represented the German finance ministry in front of the constitutional court on the recent ruling of um, on, on the ECB uh, bond purchase programs. And I think, you know, despite the ruling um, being critical of some aspects of the plan, we still managed um, staying well within the boundaries of the ruling to find a solution that allows the ECB to continue, that allows the B Bundesbank um, to continue um, executing uh, the purchase programs on behalf of the ECB and of keeping um, everything, uh, everything normal. I think as long as we are not a federal state in the European Union, um, and as long as we are more a, uh, a, a, a um, union of individual um, sovereign states, That'll be part of the the eternal um, conflict and the eternal friction that you have that the national constitutional courts um, and the European constitutional courts um, both uh, both have to find a way of coexistence. And we're quite confident that uh, that uh, you know the courts will manage that um, in a in a good way. Uh, we certainly are doing our part, but. Uh, um, of course, uh, the, due to the independence of the judicial system, um, we we really can't intervene too much in in, in that uh, process. The institutions have to figure that out. Thank you, Jörg. Um, we're now moving to uh, banking union and regulation in a broad sense. And uh, uh, in the last few months, uh, CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, uh, have made uh, the headlines and have become a mainstream topic. Uh, we published an extensive report where we're seeing the digital euro as an inevitable defense uh, of monetary sovereignty, uh, a potential boost to European strategic independence, but also as a potential Trojan horse through risk mutualization via the ECB towards uh, more European integration. Uh, what is on your opinion uh, on this front? Well, first of all, I think it's very uh, positive and uh, very commendable that the ECB is playing such a leading role in uh, embracing change and uh, in uh, thinking about ways to potentially enhance the efficiency um, and in, in enhance service to consumers by thinking about versions and uh, ways to adopt the um, the central bank digital currency. I think uh, Europe has already gone quite a long way um, to embracing quasi-CBDC for institutions and uh, corporates uh, through the target system and, uh, and everything that uh, that Europe has built in, uh, in um, making payments within Europe more efficient. Um, but CBDC certainly can play a very important role to uh, to um, in extending that to consumers and to retail. The fact that there are, of course, implications and questions, A, to the role of potential disintermediation of the financial sector, in particular the banking sector, um, and second of all, 
potential issues such as risk mutualization, such as flight to quality in a banking crisis. All of those are elements that need to be considered extremely carefully. Um, the um, ECB has produced extremely interesting technical papers on, on these matters and uh, how to address these matters. So I think it's, uh, it's going in the right direction. We're going to um, see a very extensive consultations on this topic. Um, and uh, the, the ECB is really, uh, is really at the forefront of these developments, and that's only positive. Thank you. Um, moving on to, to M&A, um, 13 one years. Word, one word, because you mentioned risk mutualization implicitly through CBDC. I think that's something where you can see very clearly that, of course, um, it, th this process needs to be on the one side, of course, move forward by the central bank because it's an issue of payments but there are a lot of issues that we will have to accompany on the legislative front as well so i think um, it, it, it's going to be a broad discussion also in um in the um in the ecofin and in the euro group as well in parallel to the issues being discussed in the ecb sure and we we will uh, keep monitoring the situation in the next weeks and months as as it develops um Moving on to to kind of the logical development of that uh, and looking backwards, 13 years uh, after the Lehman defaults, we still have a high presence of governments in banks. Uh, the banking union is still incomplete and we have had uh, virtually no cross-border uh, M&A uh, yet. Uh, why is Europe so slow in pursuing its goals? And do you think something can or should be done about it. I'm talking about EDs uh, and, and all the developments that have been talked about for a very long time and, and which we are still uh, waiting to be rolled out. Yes, so I think it's it's less the job of governments to say Bank A should do a cross-border merger with Bank B. That's certainly a decision that, uh, that businesses have to make and bank um, boards have to make. Um, we need to focus on making sure that the rules allow free movement of capital and liquidity and i think that's the big deficiency that we have and um the many many bank ceos and cfos uh, um, and board members that i speak to um all tell me pretty much the same thing that the key issue that separates europe from other big markets in the world in banking is the fact that cross-border integration is very very rudimentary and very poor in the european union uh, we have the promise to european citizens and corporates of free mobility of capital and liquidity um, across the european union i think that has been fulfilled with very efficiency enhancing effects for goods markets um, much less so for services and much, much less so for financial services. So I think that's the area where we really have to catch up. Um, and uh, we acknowledged already back in 2019 that uh, European deposit insurance can be one element of that. Uh, but we also need to consider other, other elements that are complementary, namely risk reductions in bank balance sheets, um, to avoid adverse incentives of a European deposit insurance, um, allowing for cross-border integration and uh, free movement of capital and liquidity um, um, while preserving financial stability, of course, um, making sure that our resolution framework um, is in order. So in that sense, I think it's a, it's a very holistic um, um, set of measures that have to be implemented. And we've been spending a huge amount of time um, in the Euro group and uh, in, in groups preparing the Euro group and at the technical level um, to move that for debate forward. I think we'll need a bit more time, but uh, we're certainly on the right track. Thank you, Jörg. Um, so just zooming into Germany uh, at that point, we had in the past several M&A headlines uh, that have really led uh, nowhere in practice. Does Germany need uh, larger banks and does it need to restructure the current setup through a reform of Sparkas and, and Landesbank and to get there in your view? Well, I think that uh, again goes back to, to the answer I gave uh, earlier on Europe. Um, 
that is a question that uh, you should address to the uh, bank CEOs who will also uh, be here in this conference. Uh, I would would not recommend at all any kind of political intervention um, in the question of uh, whether or not banks merge. Uh, so in that sense, uh, there have been many discussions. In fact, there are, are a lot of mergers of uh, banks in Germany um, at the regional level. Um, if you look at the number of savings banks, if you look at the number of mutual banks, uh, they are actually in a very substantial process of, uh, of uh, combining forces um, and, uh, and merging and uh, building critical mass. So I think that is happening. If you look at the number of Lundes banks, those have also gone down uh, due to uh, combinations. So in that thing, or one privatization that we've seen in the city of Hamburg. So in that sense, you know, the, the, the issues are being addressed. And I think what's, uh, what's also extremely important is that uh, all banks in Germany have certainly by now um, embraced very, very ambitious uh, programs of becoming more efficient, becoming more digital, um, and fixing their business models and adapting it to the current time. And if you look at the uh, the examples in the German banking sector, um, there is so many, um, uh, um, so much progress being made on actually addressing all these issues that. I think we're headed in the right direction from a general perspective. So uh, I wouldn't, as a, uh, as a member of the public sector, make any kind of um, recommendations um, on whether there should be mergers or not. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jörg. It's always a pleasure to have you with us uh, and listen to your perspective. Uh, it is true uh, that uh, it's been a very tough period but it's also true that uh, the response and uh, the coordinated response this time around has been different and much more encouraging uh, than, than in the past. So it makes us hopeful on the future. There are some positive signs uh, emerging in uh, the recent uh, weeks. Uh, so good luck uh, with your work and we hope to have you with us uh, soon. Okay, many thanks and hopefully uh, the next time live and in person.